Good afternoon and welcome to Skilling Up for Careers in Animation, Gaming, Graphic Design, Photography, and more. Thank you, welcome on their partnership and sponsorship for today's webinar. My name is Dana Lampy, and I'm the Executive Assistant with ACTE, the Association for Career and Technical Education, and I'll be your tech host. Today is our first webinar in a series of three. Watch for later announcements on the next two dates. For today's webinar, you may use the Q&A feature to ask the panelists questions and even make a comment or two. At the end of the webinar, a survey will appear in the browser. We appreciate if you take a moment to complete, and if you miss it, it will also be in the follow-up email. Our panelists today are Glenn Sylvester, Chair, School of Animation and Visual Effects, and Don Perro, Program Coordinator, 2D Animation and Visual Development, both from Capillaro University, North Vancouver, Canada. Our moderator today is Michelle Dick, the Educational Specialist for Wacom. Michelle, take it away. Great, thanks, Dana. Welcome, everybody. It was nice seeing everybody filing in for our um, webinar today. Thank you. Uh, as Dana did the introductions, uh, I am the Education Specialist here with Wacom. And I have the pleasure of being the moderator today. So Wacom is committed to um, supporting career and technical education. And we are excited to be part of ACTE with that, and as well as having great presenters such as Glenn and Dawn. Today's webinar focuses on career opportunities and preparation for those careers in animation, game design, graphic design, illustration, photography, and more. Fields that are growing rapidly with job and career opportunities um, that pay well for our students, often from entry level forward. Um, my slides are not moving as quickly oh. as my fingers are clicking. There we go. <laughs> So Wacom is the industry standard with our digital pen input technologies, digital ink that's used everywhere that there's creativity in the animated films that we all love, the games we play, graphic design, photography, architecture, and product design, and more. I know that around Wacom, we like to say, if you are driving it, wearing it, watching it, it was probably done on a Wacom device at some point in that development. Um, we are pleased to bring with bring you two presenters today with both industry credentials as well as the academic experience to help you prepare your students for careers that are waiting for them. And we're going to start off with a quick introduction of Glenn with over 30 years of animation experience. And as you can see in the bio on the screen, he has quite the range of pro projects that he's been involved with, also supporting students at Capilino University in the 2D and 3D animation programs, as well as serving as the chair of, uh, of the school animation and visual effects. We also have with us Don who also has over 30 years of experience in the animation industry. Don supports students in the 2D animation and visual development. And he also continues to work in the industry whenever possible as an animator, storyboard artist, and consultant. A couple of housekeeping details for our time together today. Um, please drop any of the questions uh, or comments that you have into the question and answer um field on your screen we'll curate those and at the tail end we'll have an opportunity to get those questions um, answered we are recording the webinar so please feel free once you receive that follow-up email to share with any of your colleagues or other folks that you think that would be of interest um, and at the end of at the conclusion of our webinar today we will be selecting some winners for two wacom tablets and we'll announce those via email. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dawn and Glenn. I'm so excited to hear from both of you and learn about the great things that you're doing. Gentlemen. Well, thanks for having us, Michelle, yeah. and welcome. <laughs> it's great to be on this, and hopefully we can be of service to people. Yeah. Um, I, I think we'll we'll start off, we'll, we'll talk a bit about ourselves and what 
um, bring in some information, but I'll, I think a lot of this will be questions directly to us. So, uh, Glenn, do you want to start with your sure? I, I started teaching. my path to teaching. I started as a I came out. I went to Sheridan College in near Toronto, Ontario, and uh, I came out of there wanting to be a layout artist, but I I didn't get into any of the studios immediately. So I. Uh, a friend of mine who was also a student there had gotten hired in Ottawa and got that first position and they recommended me to to also go to the same studio so I applied and got that position as an in-betweener on the Raccoons TV show which that's where me and Don met and then from there I uh, just started honing my skills as a professional artist and big break from that became an animator in Ottawa that but I be, uh, got to be uh, assistant animator on Roger Rabbit in London so uh, big break from there after that uh, a few more years different just bouncing around different countries and studios just always trying to find a new stage a new step to improve my skills because for me the the quality of my work was always the security that I'd find in the industry it wasn't uh it wasn't uh, necessarily getting in at the, the best studio or anything. It was about the quality of my work, knowing that would be what would uh, build security in this industry. From there, uh, got a really another big, uh, again, it's it's all people you work with and get to know you. They like you. They, don't, they know your work's uh, good quality. And they recommended me to ILM in 1996. I switched to 3D animation there. So I worked on the, uh, what was the first thing was Men in Black and then Mummy, Star Wars, different things like that. Then I bounced back to Toronto, uh, got to work on Magic School Bus in Toronto as an assistant director. Then I later on became a director at Nelvana in Toronto. <clears throat> From there, I went back, I went a little bit back into 3D. Uh, so 11 years 2D, traditional hand-drawn work, and then into 3D animation for about 20 years. The last thing I did was work as a, a lead animator at Sony Imageworks, both in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then they moved me up here to Vancouver about uh, 11 years ago. So, and then from there, uh, this opportunity came up to teach at Capilano University. So I went, I applied for that and got that. One of the things I meant to mention about at the studios, when I started at ILM, we got six weeks training. And by the end of it, by by when around when I was leaving Sony, it was down to maybe a week's training. So it was really hard for junior animators to get that the, the time and the effort to uh, grow a lot more. And, and it was kind of sink or swim. So I really wanted to get more into education on this end of it and to do it more full time to help uh, just skill those animators up so that they could hit the ground running a little bit better when they got to studios. So that's kind of my way into this. Don, do you want to? Sure. Um, so my approach was a little different. I I, uh, I was going to be a graphic designer like my older brother and uh, running straight on towards that goal. And I didn't get accepted into my first application to art school. Uh, in Ontario, Canada, and uh, realized I needed to apply to more places, so someone who would take me. And uh, uh, I got into a, an art school here in Vancouver, and it was a um, I was went through the foundation year, and was in second year where you specialize for three years in your in your area, which was graphic design. I'd managed to get in uh, to that, and realized after seeing my friends who had taken gone into animation instead of graphic design I, they had done flip books that first day and shot them on an old video test and I went and saw their work after a boring day of lectures uh, and it was like magic seeing their drawings come alive and move and I was just shocked and I, I went to the instructor and said I'd like to change over to animation and <laughs> after thinking about it and he said there's no work and even if they found work, there's no money. Yeah. And, I, and I just said, I don't care. I have to do this. I have to learn how this magic is done. And so I got into it. And first year was the most fun I'd ever had. Like It's like magic tricks every day, how birds fly, making characters walk. And I couldn't get enough of it. And I started thinking, how could I do this forever in first year animation without paying tuition? And the idea was to become a teacher. But back in 19... 
81, there were no very few schools that taught it and very few teachers. So my plan was to retire my teacher, <laughs> work for find work and get work and get experience and then come back and just when he's ready to retire and take over. Uh, it didn't happen like that. I, I, I couldn't find work because I didn't have the skills. Uh, it was a filmmaking program and really didn't know what the industry required or could draw as well as I should have. And I, but I did manage to get in as a cell painter in Ottawa and worked, uh, got in for like two weeks and worked in as a, in, in on the production side and was able to, to, uh, shift over and, and get in between and where I met Glenn <laughs> not yeah. long ago. And, uh, we've been friends ever since, uh, and, and, uh, Worked there for two years and then went to Germany. I actually got a job in Germany when didn't have any animation either, which was how I could get hired. Uh, and after a month, uh, that the director of this uh, Sandman, Zanmenchen, uh show, uh, he had a kind of a breakdown and they uh, quit and they asked me to take over. And so I was directing within like three, four years uh, in Europe, uh, continued to work, came back to, and Glenn visited me from Roger Rabbit, would come over for the weekend. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I uh, got back to Canada after a couple of years in Germany and uh, worked again on a show called The Raccoons. Uh, and uh, then after two years, then they started another program. And at the time there were so few animation schools um, that it was exciting, but it, it wasn't my 10 year plan that I had. It was happening in six. So I didn't think I was worthy, but managed to get in and uh, was helped, helped to build that program. And after four years uh, came full circle back to Vancouver where they needed uh, to set up uh, the department. So I've been here for 28 years, going on 29 and uh, set up a 2D program. Four years later, we had a 3D program and shortly after that, a visual effects program. So we still have those three two-year diploma programs aimed at just getting people a strong enough foundation so they can get out into the industry and succeed. And uh, uh, yeah, so we were able to, to bring Glenn in uh, yeah. a few years ago, uh, which is great. And he's been awesome. And uh, we've been we've had a lot of success with uh, we currently have grads working at Disney, DreamWorks, Pixar. Uh, we mostly work towards building the local industry uh, by by providing yeah. them with with uh, raw talent that can people who can get out and get working right away. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, so that's how we got into animation. Um, Glenn and I have also taught at the high school level. We did an animation workshop, uh, an an animation um, a semester long class uh, for high school students uh, that that stopped when COVID hit. Yeah. Um, I've been working on tools. So um, basically, for I guess most of our uh, attendees are high school level instructors. I guess so. But anyway, I I guess uh, we can get into our techniques and how we do this. Uh, And if there are questions, you can write them in the column. So I was going to kind of mention that as tools have changed, as I mentioned before, I started with pencil and paper and uh, transitioned at ILM to digital to start working with puppets and virtual virtual characters and the three space. And so that was a quite a big leap at the time for myself and for a lot of animators. Uh, they had a few recent graduates in 1996, 95, who had some of the experience with the software, but they, their animation skills weren't as strong. So they got a few of us old, older, older uh, uh, 2D animators that they thought we had an aptitude to learn the computer. And they were we were then helping each other with the, the 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 more skilled with the software we're teaching the people who are a little bit more skilled with actual motion and timing and, and skills like that so it's really important i think still to understand that these are all tools and that the the underlying principles of animation apply whether you you're doing stop motion 3d 2d traditional or or digital 
animation. It's it's all kind of the same principles, and that's what we really stress here at Capilano. Do you want to add to that, Don? Or sure. Um, software is becoming more and more important. Yeah. Um, partly because of the advance of technology, and partly because of software marketers telling everybody it's needed, and. Uh, we you know we we started with paper flipping paper yeah. and shooting the animation and and drawing seems to have gone by the wayside but i think if there's one important lesson it's that drawing is as important as it's ever been even more so now because uh so many schools don't teach it or don't teach it to the level that they used to so it's a it's a missing skill and and you see that uh we saw that when 2d animation was being shut off at disney after uh princess and the frog and winnie the pooh they stopped making 2d features and uh dreamworks followed suit or did it stop before them i think um, it stopped before, before yeah disney and now, but it was at the time I, I, re I remember I transitioned to 3D in 96 and then by 99 everybody was kind of forced to transition off of 2D so and but it, we, but we it's thought revived. as a program yeah go ahead but it's revived really strongly well at the and time we thought yeah we were going to we were going to be dead in the water because yeah. we were looking around saying well where are our grads in the 2D program going because there is no 2D and for years we focused on design and students would go out and get design works. Uh, and then Flash came in to save animation. And we had animators again. This was 2000. And, uh, and animation became a thing again. And because things we, will be outsourced. You know, if it's cheaper to be done somewhere else, it will be. Um, India, China, and Vancouver itself is, a, is an outsourcing location for, for American studios. So... Uh, the idea was that that okay what are we going to do there's no 2d animation uh and i thought well if there are 22 students who want to learn this i'm going to keep teaching it because i think it's it's valuable and after three years it came back and uh our students had a niche that other schools weren't providing uh, so I think sticking the, the, the rule for the, or the lesson learned from this is that stick to the foundation skills that will never change. And that's drawing skill, design knowledge, uh, and um, animation timing and principles, uh, strong posing, uh, storytelling, composition. These things are always part of it. Yeah, no, for sure. I, that's, I totally agree with that, that I've seen... I've seen people who maybe can't draw as well in 3D, but they're they're still kind of sculpting the 3D puppets into in a certain way that it it still it is a 2D image in the end, but but they're really kind of sculpting the characters, especially on Hotel Transylvania 2, where Gendy was doing those drawings and and we had to match those drawings. You really had to square off the eyelids and things like that. And it's all it's all those 2D design skills that really really proved their worth at that time. So kind of a, because uh, I, I remember when I switched from 2D, I had always struggled. I'm, I'm hard on myself, but I struggled with draftsmanship, I feel. And then I got to 3D and then I could, I could do all that sculpted posing and stuff. And it was really easier. It seemed easier, but then I got onto Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. And it, again, it was all the 2D skills that really, uh, were kind of re resurfaced and reforced to realize a little bit more clearly that I need to really understand design shape language and things like that. And it's all those principles come back. So, yeah. There is a question um, in the column. Uh, so what softwares or types of experience might you recommend for a middle school art teacher who wants to introduce these things to students? Um, so you have access to iPads, but few computers. So that was our position as well mm -hmm. when we taught in West Vancouver, um, that class. Yeah. Uh, whatever, really, the, our, our, our philosophy towards software is, uh, is that it's a required evil. And uh, uh, you have to use it. It's a tool. But if there's something that we can do that you know, is cheaper or something that still works when then we may go for that. It depends on, you have to look at everything separately. However, um, you know, drawing, uh, one of the things I wanted to emphasize was that uh, 
I think drawing on paper should be part of every course, even though it's not the latest thing. And it, it is, a lot of students may have a, a bit of a wall between it, uh, but getting them comfortable with drawing and not realizing that they're drawing to create pretty pictures, but they're, they're building a skill that will allow them to learn faster. Because when you can draw what you see, you can analyze everything. And it's one of the things I emphasize is action analysis and uh, drawing from the screen. We've got so much opportunity to have a big screen and be able to stop frame things, whether you, um, you know, whatever tools you have, you know, whether it's YouTube, uh, you can just use the period and comma key and advanced frame YouTube back and forth. And that's been available for years that, and people don't know about it. And you can sit there with a piece of paper, a, a sketchbook, something firm to draw on and, and the tools even there don't really matter uh, and you can just draw what you see and you'll learn composition you'll learn storyboarding uh, I, I my my story I don't know if Dean likes this but he came as a guest speaker Dean DeBlois who directed How to Train Your Dragon Lilo and Stitch uh, we worked together with the we were yeah. oh y'all worked together in the early days in Ottawa and he came as a guest before he went to Disney after he was coming from Ireland. And uh, I asked him about this action analysis, how students can learn animation by drawing frame, looking at frames frame by frame and drawing it on paper. And he said, yes, that's how I learned how to storyboard. He would take Citizen Kane and draw the first and last frame of each scene yeah. and basically reconstruct, re -engine, like reverse engineer the film on paper. And he learned all the techniques that Orson Welles was using in that film. And he's an amazing storyboard artist, yeah, as you, you know, from the films. Uh, but that was his advice then. So you can learn anything, character design, drawing. The trick is to let students know that to show that work is cheating and plagiarism. But you, every designer copies to learn other designers in whatever field, fashion, auto design. Um, everybody learns from their the history and, and just copies it to learn it. Sorry, that's my big diet. <laughs> I just have to say that. So no matter what the, uh, what the software you have available, it's not a bad idea to get them working on sketchbooks every day uh, and just drawing things that they see and not to worry about how it is. They don't have to show anybody. It's kind of like a diary, but just drawing things, locations, animals, objects like bicycles, uh, and just challenge themselves. Start with simple things that they can achieve easily and build up to more complex things. Um, you know, that would be my advice. And and then look at software after that. So so students love Clip Studio. Uh, you know what else? Yeah, Blender. Blender's got Grease Pencil, which is a really good uh, uh, two D tool. But it I, it takes it takes a certain amount of knowledge of Blender in order to access. The 2D tools, so it, it is a little bit more of a learning curve, but but it's another free one. So and Procreate uh, is really great on iPads. So it's really fun to draw with, and uh, you know I've seen a lot of my colleagues and stuff doing a lot of amazing work with just something so simple. So so yeah. Glenn, in your yeah. introduction, you uh, had mentioned that studios. Have kind of transitioned and when students are coming and entering the field they're down to one week of training yeah but yeah, that's usually what, they have can, what can we do as educators to help get that and you touched on that just a minute ago well, about some of those foundational well, skills but perhaps you yeah. can expand on that a little bit sure i mean we teach the process in the 3d especially the 3d where i teach a little bit more than 2d i teach harmony as well but <clears throat> Uh, we talk about process a lot and about so that the students get used to handing in work early and often so that it's an iterative process instead of uh, just waiting till the last minute, throwing everything together and handing it in on the last day. I, uh, it's really important for them to, as professional artists, that they under, have to understand that they're going to have to show their work early and often. And to that, and to address notes, they'll take notes. They start to develop a little bit of a thick skin that you're going to get that kind of uh, constructive criticism early. And so we, we, I think that's a lot of what we do to help build up that kind of confidence. That once they get into the studio, they'll understand that process, that iterative process. And it's really important for them to to 
function that way, especially hitting the studios. Uh, one thing I do a lot is I uh, also do group dailies because I remember back on Five O Ghost West, we're back. We used to have a lot of one on one time with the directors. And it was really nice that you had that one on one time with the director, but you didn't get to see what everybody else was working on in the studio. So we do group dailies where everybody kind of has to have, you have to watch, but you also learn from other people's mistakes as well as your own. And you and you hear the notes for the other people and you learn from learn through osmosis from other people and hearing that kind of stuff. So I think that's really valuable as well. So that's how we kind of get them a little bit more ready for the industry is by taking those processes that I experienced in the industry and trying to enter them into the classroom so they're getting a little bit of more sense of what what's going to be expected of them. Does that help? No, I think that's great. I okay. I know as uh, you know, we mentioned a lot of our participants today are educators and we're looking mm -hmm. for how do we support our students because that's where our work is rooted. So thinking about mm -hmm. what you see for students coming into you at university level and then going one step further. So how, you know, just, getting some also, of those foundations. I would also add the just curiosity of how, like, especially with software, we get a lot of people who've never maybe really worked a lot of more high-end softwares like Maya or something like that. And there's a lot of buttons, right? It's really confusing and oh, there's all these different panels and stuff. So it can be overwhelming. But as an animator, I'm really just working with the graph editor and 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 function curves and and there's it's you can break down the interface that way and, and just focus on smaller tasks. And I've always thought about that as how I've learned is I I think of it as learning plateaus. I'll go up a learning curve and then plateau and get used to the new what I've just learned and then I'll take on the next step. And so I really try to instill that into students is don't don't think of it as just this constant uphill struggle is just to relax, learn this one thing, overcome that worry, and then you'll build up the confidence that yeah, I can I, I can do this. I can learn anything. Google is always helpful, right? You can find things. Uh, you know, it's the people who just kind of my biggest worry is is when they just kind of give up because something went wrong and you, you're just trying to calm them down and okay that went wrong but the, you know there is a certain logic to how computers work and how software is built so once you start to understand one like I started with soft image then I went to 3d studio max then I went to uh, Maya then to Houdini then back to Maya I've learned harmony on, kind of more or less on my own uh, I had uh, Adobe Animate, so it's it's all just different tools. But under underneath it all is this understanding of motion, timing, posing, all these things. And that's again, it's I know it's a lot, but it's step by step you can learn it all. So. And getting back to Leah's question about middle school and what you should use, I think you can use anything. Uh, yeah. And and your your goals would probably be different from ours. So so we really want to make sure students have a good experience, which isn't different from any school. We all want that, uh, but they need to get jobs. And if they're not getting jobs, then we're not successful. And and but in 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 middle school uh it's it's different you're you're exploring and experimenting and i think the main thing is to to look at what you want for the student experience and then work backwards from that in terms of what do you need for it and then try to find it because a lot of times you you can get away with things when when <laughs> as another story for carla if you were talking to me about more stories but when we started uh we were all 2d we flipped paper and to teach something I would have to gather six of our 24 students around me because you couldn't get more. And I would flip paper at the drafting table and animate a walk and show them how it works and what the process is. And you would do that repeatedly until the class learned that. And then what happened was two amazing things. Uh, Adobe Animate, which was called Flash by Macromedia at the time, it came out and uh, the Wacom Graphire came out, which was a $99 tablet came out in October 99. I, I remember it. And and because I said, this is, we, I had big ones like from Wacom earlier, but they were, they would take up your whole table and they weren't applicable. And, and this was $99. And I was like, let's use this. And we brought them into a lab 
And so I would teach a class and I would teach at the drafting tables. And then we would all get up and move over into the lab for me to continue teaching. And I realized it was more efficient because I could half draw things and they could start with a part of a quadruped and finish it off and, and learn that way. And I could just teach once rather than repeatedly with six people behind me. And it was so much more efficient. And so we had that in 99 early and and uh, that helped us a lot when Flash made a big jump and people were doing e-cards and our students were, you know, getting summer jobs and getting hired just so that they could teach the studio this software that they knew that the studios didn't know yet, but realized they needed. Uh, so so uh, uh, that worked out really well. And then when the Cintiqs came, you know, we got one and nobody used it. They all preferred the little tablets. And, and it was the at the teacher station. But then one guy who was interested in doing layouts started working on it and then it became more popular. And so every year we would buy a few more Cintiqs until we had a full lab. And then we moved into this new building, the Bose Animation Center, uh, Film and Animation Center. And, and uh, we had we were had those two classrooms where you'd go off into the lab and go back to your tables. And I told the the um, the person in charge who was building, I said, how would you like how much are these rooms worth in this brand new building and uh, these classrooms? And he, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, would you like another one? He says, well, the so building's already done. I said, no, would you like to take one of our rooms and use it for whatever you want? He says, how do we do that? I said, well, you take the Cintiqs from the Cintiq lab into our classroom and mm -hmm. buy more Cintiqs for the first years because we had two classes and uh now you that cintiq room is now a classroom and he said how much would that cost and i had already done the numbers and i told him he goes okay and well maybe and and then later he told my colleague it was the best deal he ever made but it was great for us too because now mm -hmm. people had that digital access you know mm -hmm. continuously and they they uh they st we still use paper we've got old pictures of a drafting table and you would turn around there'd be a a walk -em with an ergotron arm uh, on it and they could just draw and then digital drawing digital or just use the digital as their their you know model sheets it, it worked really well but um you know but we couldn't afford a whole lab but we were able to bring it in piece by piece and and go on from there and you could see uh the the quality of the grad show like you, now they're using color now they're learning more things um, although i still think paper teaches you deeper it, you you seem yeah. to you seem to remember things. I don't know if there's research done it's on like, it. But... It's like the hand handwritten notes will you'll you'll remember things deeper than than typing. So yeah, and during COVID, I did life drawing on a Cintiq, which was cool because you could just flip to the next frame rather than changing your big newsprint page. Um, but you know, drawing on paper is still like life drawing on paper is still the way to go. For, like from a live model. Uh, you know, and uh, and, uh, and again, that sketchbook idea is is great to keep students grounded uh, with those those that drawing skill. It's just too easy to erase things digitally sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Don, I love hearing uh, stories about the history of Wacom. I encounter lots of teachers who are like, I still have my Wacom tablet from 2004. <laughs> and, you know, those are, yeah. are, are great stories. Um, I have other educators who have shared similar um, pieces in their high school CTE classes where they have, you know, slowly getting more and more devices each year mm -hmm. as budgets permit and then filtering down what, you know, once their lab was complete, sending down to middle school so they could start to grow their programs at middle school and then into high school to continue that participation. But you're right, there's always that balance within education where we need to find between the analog and the digital. So that way our, we're able to code switch. We can go seamlessly between those mm -hmm. two pieces. And I, I liked your example, how you can physically turn your desk and I'm gonna move this way <laughs> and go and back, back to my paper. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we that have some tricks too, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We have some tricks too. Like, I don't know if you can see this, but there's Velcro on this pen. Mm -hmm. Because I always wanted, I, I, the perfect one would be a hover pen that just floats in front of your face. So you always know where it is. But I, I put Velcro on the, the right top right of my Cintiq and I can just lay it there lightly and, and pick it up and use it. Um, and then we also Velcroed these to our Cintiqs. I don't know if you know what this is or if you recognize this from history. Uh, it's a peg bar. 
uh, for paper to like sit on and flip. And we have tables, we have portable tables we can use, but I actually Velcroed these to the bottom of the Cintiq and the Cintiq becomes my backlight for flipping paper. We, we don't teach much paper anymore. Uh, COVID kind of got rid of that, but you know, we did do a walk cycle because it's eight pages that it's only eight drawings and it's still kind of important for students to know how to flip and why flipping is important to stay on model with your character or to, to you know, basically to stay on model. Anyway, <laughs> I go on. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm going to do a quick pop over. We have a lot of agreement with the things that you're sharing um from audience members and just kind of hearing all of these uh these stories about <laughs> the work that you've done with students i'm also curious what um what are some of those kind of soft skills perhaps that you see students coming in yes they have developed these skills as an artist but what are some other skills that you're seeing in your more successful students they're coming in with some other soft skills developed what does that look like Glenn, you... yeah i think it's i alluded to it earlier a little bit of curiosity about uh how things work and just to be able to uh advocate for themselves and to you know just try something first look for look for an answer look to their their fellow students for answers things like that before immediately kind of giving up or or, or coming coming to you immediately oh this is broken I've had a couple of students who said photoshop's broken what part of it what 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 you know like what's not working you know like so coming coming with a little bit more I guess acuity about what exact how things work and how or and how to search for answers. Uh, other skills is just reacting to criticism. Uh, some people will get really really upset by any kind of criticism, and that's if you're going to go into animation as a as a, a an artist as a, a production artist, you have to be able to build that thick thick skin to be able to take and it and nobody i long gone are the days when people would scream at you at, at studios they can't do that anymore because they'll get sued so that's not going to happen so don't be fearful about that it's just really just reacting to create constructive criticism and to be able to okay trying to filter out okay what's really wrong and how can i fix this and make it better and you know because everybody on on a crew everybody's just trying to make the best thing they can in the time given that's all it you know Every studio I've been at virtually has been that that's been what we wanted to do. Everybody's helping each other to get better and make a better, better film, better TV show, better whatever. So I would add to it that uh, a, another soft skill would just be to be able to get along with people, mm -hmm. um, even people who are different from you and realize that if you're in a class, you're all going for the same goal. And, you know, with us, it's a job and it's also a job that requires a huge team in, in animation. It's, it's not solo unless you're making your own film. And uh, so I, I teach the first semester animation class to both of our cohorts. And uh, what my, my big goal then is to a couple things, teach them how to follow instructions because no one follows instructions and some go off on a tangent and you have to be kind, but still strong about getting them back on because following instructions is how they succeed in life. And they can choose when and when to rebel, but some cases you just need to follow them uh, it, it, to, to get you there faster if that's your goal. Uh, so one is to follow instructions, but more importantly, it's just to be nice because in a classroom, you can get a really, um, uh, you know, uh, disruptive uh, two or three students that can take over the class and turn that whole class around. And so my goal is to, in a nice way, kind of guide them back and make sure that the majority of the class are all helpful and working together and realize that you'll learn more and, and get further ahead faster if you're working as a team 
uh, supporting each other, helping each other, teaching each other, critiquing their work in a in a positive way, uh, and, and you'll end up with a much bigger success than if you just hide your work from everybody and do everything on your own. So, so that's a really important soft skill, and um, also just doing the work because in animation, graphics, photography, you don't learn unless you do. You have to create things to learn, and that's the best way. If you know no software, give yourself a project that uses that software, and by the end of it, you'll have a you know fair competence with it. So, so you have to do things. So our our program is is quite intense, uh, but we're always talking about health and family and maintaining your health, not doing all nighters because they destroy you, uh, and and uh, getting sleep and getting yourself fed <laughs> you know th that's yeah. important so anyway those are soft skills is just be able to take care of yourself but be really be nice to everyone and realize that they all have something to teach you uh yeah, for sure. and in this industry yeah. they might be your boss like with us you know yeah. the sec the teachers all work in the industry so they know they can see a student and they you know they can decide you know is a student good so they know all need to be um working towards that sorry glenn go ahead no, no, no. Just kind of agreeing with everything. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah well, it, that, especially that the part about that, you know, somebody younger than you might end up being your boss and that's happened. Yeah. People who were my junior became my bosses and you, you know, you, you're happy for them, but, but there, there is that weird dynamic, but then you ever, you just have to be, it really pays to be a good human being. That's always a good lesson yeah. to come out of things. It pays to be yeah. a good human being. I, so I, yeah. I think there should be more, more t-shirts that say that for us. Um, you guys have touched on a lot of foundational skills. Uh, Don, I've heard you come back to creating the walk book and, you know, that's, a, that's that foundational piece. What are, what is, a for each of you, what's a favorite lesson that you enjoy most introducing to students or working with students on um, at a lesson or project level? Um, for me in 2D, um, the most important lesson, you know, in, in fact, the, the first semester of animation is really everything, you know, and we keep, you know, I talked to a grad who said, yeah, that course, that's the course that keeps on giving because it applies to everything. It takes so long to learn animation principles, mm -hmm. uh, to understand them. So uh, one of the, the course, one of the ones I like is, um, uh, is a is a character that's very loosely drawn just stru structure mostly just circle for like a, the the structure of a biped is torso hips and cranium and the rest is attached with lines and so i do a simple structure give it to them say this is your character and sit it on a mechanical bull uh and then i i have a pre-animated mechanical bull going you know just there and it starts slowly and goes there and then back and then there and then back and then it goes forward and just stop suddenly and so the they have to they have to animate the character on this bull uh, the bull's already done but they have to add the character and we talk about how to do it maybe just the hips first and then the torso and is the torso dragging and is the head attached to the torso and it's dragging behind the torso but then what happens when the primary action changes direction some things want to keep going right it's mm -hmm. physics but you don't tell them that it's physics and, and uh you know and then the it'll reach the end of its tether and the torso will come back but the head will keep going down until it reaches its tether which is the neck and they have and you can give them examples but that is so important because it just comes back over and over again no matter what you're animating yeah. And and, uh, and it shows you that you can't just key things out because if you key like a, a swing, if you just have two poses and just in between, it's going to look boring. But there's all this overlapping action because some things start moving forward while other things are still moving back. Mm -hmm. And you have to and you have to know that. And that's a huge animation skill that when recruiters see it, they know you've got it. And if they see that you don't have it, then they know you're still student material. Uh, so go I'm, ahead. Trying, I'm, I'm trying to think of what we do a lot of similar projects in 3d at, in the first year and uh, i like to do one where it's it's the, we do the bouncing ball obviously so the, the different different formulas for that but we also do one where the ball is hopping up some stairs so it's it's a real different challenge for them to think about how the ball is generating its own momentum versus the the uh, passive momentum things like that so 
and the bouncing ball it sounds you know i remember being at sheridan and and you know like oh yeah waving flag bouncing ball yeah yeah when do we get to really animate when do we really get to animate and stuff and these are such foundational lessons and the way the bouncing ball you can add that timing to a walk and give it a little bit more weight and things like this that happened later when i was in studios and and things would you know be floaty or weightless and and my animation director would just take my drawings and he'd cut it with an exacto knife and he'd pull it down and tape it sellotape and then he he said shoot that on the, the video recorder and suddenly it had so much more weight this little bouncing ball and it was so foundational exercises that really pay off later and 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 they're in every like i teach the students like in in a point that there's two frames you'll stick for two frames like the bouncing ball then pull back so when a character points there's two frames and then it pulls back so it's it's the same timing as a bouncing ball it's it's so it, all these foundational things will lend themselves so much to when you're in the field and i always tell my students there's days where you just don't feel like you're not feeling creative you're not that whatever that flow is not happening you'll have these foundational formulas and skills that you can just get something to dailies you'll be able to just get something through to dailies and get a reaction and f at least find out that's not what they want so you get some sort of feedback and and you'll and you'll have all of these their their formulas but you know and i'd like to use the analogy of cooking that it's not baking nothing's going to collapse if you don't follow the formula it's a little bit more like cooking where you know you throw in a little bit of oregano or this or that and different ingredients and you know no, one, no one's going to get hurt and i have one more piece of advice that i i learned in college from one of my teachers who was a calligraphy expert and actually had stamps reproduce and has his own letter set font and uh he had us in a drawing class put everything on the wall and I was like a 20 year old and I'm thinking, oh no, I can't do this. But but it was such a learning opportunity because when when you put your drawings on the wall and you can just see right away all the variations and you can decide for yourself which one looks good. And, and actually that's how I learned how to, how to, I became a much better animator when I was a teacher because I was putting student work up there and I was supposed to critique it. And I don't know, and, and but you could, everybody can see what's good and what's what's weak. And you start to see why it's good. And that taught me so much about basics that I didn't get in school and I didn't have time for to learn in the industry. So comparative critiques of everybody, whether it's drawings uh, on the wall side by side of a, of a pose, like you know, we'll, we'll say uh, a character pulling on a rope, you know, from a, you know, that's nailed to the ground or something, just pose that and let's see what you do. And you put those up there and you can see the ones that really work and the ones that don't. And, and that's really great. And same with animation. And getting students to critique uh, okay. other people's work in a in a positive way, not in a mean way. Just say what's what could be done to make it better, not necessarily what's bad. And uh, and that will teach them a lot too. So so teaching uh, or critiquing uh, teaches the student a lot as well. Right. We are getting close to our last little bit of time uh, with Don and Glenn. I wanted to give um, an opportunity to those in the audience. We've been going through the questions that have been coming in um, and I've been weaving them in. But here's a last a last uh, chunk of time here. If you want to drop something in that question and answer uh, for Glenn and Don. Um, I know that this has been a great learning experience for myself, just hearing about the importance of the work that you're doing and what your students are doing and kind of how to prioritize. And Don, I, I agree. I often learn the most when I, it's time for me to teach something because I'm expected to, to know yeah. it inside and out. And you have that opportunity to be reflective, right? Reflective on that piece of work in front of you. Okay, so we do have one last question coming in um, from an anonymous attendee. How do you feel about AI and its effect on design? And uh, we knew that would be there. We, we thought it would be. Oh, didn't yeah. We? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Go ahead. You go ahead. Join, yeah, I, you know, I in animation we use a lot of libraries, like uh, animation libraries, 
So for to me, AI is like kind of going to a, a visual library and pulling something up. It might be kind of pulling up unique, but so say I have two different run cycles in a, in a run library, I bring them in, maybe map them on to the same character, try both and see which one fits best. So I, I look at it kind of that way. It's not, I don't see it, I see it as a tool rather than uh, replacing the animator myself. But, and I always think that we're, I still believe that uh, humans, we're still really good at lateral thinking and AI still is a, is an infancy when it comes to lateral thinking. And when I got to Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, it was such a different uh, thought process. The, the F Phil Lord and, and Chris Miller very unique style of animation that I'd never come across. I, I was always taught the Disney way, which is big takes and, and lots of arcing things and things like that. And they were very much subtle, subtle animation. They wanted very specific and it was really new to me. So the, I see that's where humans intervene. And that's where we will always be strong is, is in this new way of thinking. Whereas I, AI to me will still just kind of, uh, coalesce what is what exists so and, and one thing i learned over the years was like turn your back on technology at your own risk uh mm -hmm. you know and really if you embrace technology if you you know if you know it before other people do then you become a leader you become sought out for and sometimes you can monetize that uh i did in flash you know creating animated buttons for websites like you know just you know for ad agencies and, and and doing ad agency work because they 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 couldn't find flash animators anywhere and and it, it, I, I I learned it and became like really good at it and so so that was was what like made things a lot easier uh credibility and, and things so um I think with AI you just kind of have to research it think about it but don't hide from it like jump in and try it out and see how it can work for you. Uh, one thing that AI does is it makes us a little more cautious on our admissions uh, with portfolios. Uh, we've always wondered, you know, you always want the portfolios to be authentic and original. So, uh, so we, and everybody talks online, so they all know each other and, and they, you know, there's guides and things. Uh, so we, we just sent this year, we just sent out a, a little uh, hand drawn on paper assignment for them to do something they might get in first semester design class where they had to design a family of four uh two parents and a kid or one one parent and two children and a pet and uh, we gave them a situation to pose them in and it was to be done in a week on paper in pencil scanned or just photographed with their camera and sent back to us it didn't change the order a lot but we could see who sent it back in three days and you know it, it, it was specific so uh could have been faked but you know we could easily give it to them that's we could give them that assignment again in september when they come here uh, so, you know, that's how we kind of hedge our bets. But I, I think, you know, just don't don't be blind to, to new technology because it mm -hmm. could really take you further ahead. When we had to decide on 3D software when we first started the program, because we had one 3D course in, in 2D back in 95. And uh, I, I went through them all and I said, oh, let's pick 3D Studio Max because it just came out. Everybody knows this other stuff, but this is brand new. So our students will, will be on the same level as everybody else trying to learn it. Uh, you know, so, you know, learning Photoshop now, there'll be a million people ahead of you with Photoshop. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, something new comes out, nobody knows it. So it's always great to, to try that out. Well, Don, that's a great transition into our final question. Um, Erica was asking about... Uh, what you feel is the most valuable industry certification for students in high school media arts programs, and they currently require Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, etc. So what type of certifications do you see as a value for high school students? I'm not really into certification. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and neither are the studios. If, no, like, no, if they hire no you... No ever asked me for certification of software it's more they want you to like I said I had the multiple different 3d packages and it's the same kind of base knowledge of how things move in three space and 
that I can apply to any software package. I can now learn Blender and work in Blender because I, I have that sense of how things work from other software. So Clip Studio Paint is becoming really popular with a lot of our students are coming in with that and they kind of kick and scream that they have to learn Photoshop, but the industry is still using Photoshop. So they want us sure. to graduate people with Photoshop skills. So, yeah. We, I, I just had this conversation with, yeah. with a software person and, and I said, so how do we become a certified school for this? And he goes, well, you need to be a three-year program before we could certify you. Oh. I'm sorry. I hope, hope the person is, is watching. I'm not, I'm not meaning to make fun of them, but it just affected me this way. Like, well, why can't a two-year program that knows and teaches the software really well be certified? Like, isn't it good for both of us? But, you know, I'm thinking, but then I didn't even push it. I just said, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's not a big deal. And, and students will think that, like, they think they, they need to have you know the the best school diploma or uh you know and it's really a portfolio that industries look for they look for your capabilities and your personality your ability to work on a team that's what they they look for they don't care what grade you got in in animation history or uh they they uh they they even if you you know they, they do like to know that you went to a school because they they know that you've been properly set up that you don't have a lot of like you know vacuums of of knowledge but they uh but you know and, and even when you pick a school like the main thing isn't what the school is the school or how much you pay to get in uh the main thing is how hard are you going to work and if you can bring that message to to students that's great it's it's really the hard worker yes. uh the one who's passionate about what they're doing and really want to be there uh they're the ones who are going to succeed no matter which school they're at uh, i think Right. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're going to um, kind of shift gears into a little bit of continuing on with what uh, Dawn was chatting about with the usage of Wacom devices in their uh, labs and kind of creating those spaces. And as the market leader in pen-based tablet technology, we're considered to be that industry standard. That's what you're going to see in the studios. That's what you're going to see folks working with. And so we're excited to be able to support in education and getting our high school students that exposure. So that way they're not learning a new software and a new hardware or those tools, but they start to cultivate their craft in that same balanced ecosystem of some paper and some digital and um, you know, Don mentioned this was a $99 solution. We still have devices that are at that price point <laughs> These, this up to today. So that's a great place for um, students to still have access to things that way. Um, because we are the industry standard for creative industry careers to use our products and education is just one way that we're able to prepare students for their own academic and industry careers. We do have a full lineup of education product. Um, but what we see, and the, the, this product range from the most basic pen tablets all the way up to our front of classroom podium displays, but where we see a lot of our CTE classes and our art classrooms are the utilization of our Intuos Pro tablet um, and then our Cintiq uh, pen displays. Uh, we always like to share that if you're a Game of Thrones fan, the uh, the dragons were drawn on the Intuos Pro. These, you know, not a big fancy pen display, but the Intuos Pro was the artist's choice for drawing out the dragons on Game of Thrones. Uh, so for... Shell froze. Oh. With you with sound? Still no sound. There we go. I can hear you. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was. That was strange. Well, in addition to utilizing the right hardware, Don and Glenn also touched on the idea of there's a range of software 
Um, we chatted about those certifications and things. And with the Wacom products, we have a lot of different partners with the purchase of a Wacom uh, product. You have access to some of that partner software to try out and see what works best for you. Um, it is a great tool. community. Um, I'm going to grab this content to put in the chat for you. And uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you on some future presentations. Um, thank you for attending today. And our winners from today's presentation will also be um, announced via email in that follow up. And I did want to come back uh, with a thank you to Don and Glenn and I always like to pull those those nuggets and that quotable pieces that's going to kind of stick with me uh, as I listen to speakers. And Glenn, what really stuck with me is in your beginning introduction when you shared the quality of my work was my security in this industry. Mm -hmm. I think that's just such a, a strong statement and something in teaching our students to be proud of the work that they're putting forth um, is an important idea to walk away from. And then... Um, Don sharing just the excitement for learning that we always like to see in education when you were talking about when you were learning animation for the first time, it was like learning magic and seeing magic every day. So uh, thank you for sharing so much of your process and what you're doing um, with your students and kind of leaving us with so many great things to think about today. Uh, thank you so much, Dana. I wasn't sure if you have a closure for housekeeping today, uh, but I see you popped back on there. Is there anything we need? No, again, just thank you everyone for attending today and there will be a follow up email and a survey at the end. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you from ACTE. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.